So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, chapter 13. We'll read two, only two verses from chapter 13, and then we'll turn to chapter 14, skipping ahead, and read the first 20 verses there, and then we'll go again to the Gospel of Mark. So Leviticus 13, and we'll read verses 45 and 46, and then we'll skip ahead to chapter 14. So Leviticus 13, starting in verse 45. The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. And he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Now we skip ahead to chapter 14, starting at verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall look out of the camp, and the priest shall look. Then if the case of the leprous disease is healed in the leprous person, the priest shall command them to take for him who is to be cleansed two live clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthenware vessel over fresh water. He shall take the live bird with the cedar wood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop and dip them in the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird go into the open field. And he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off all his hair and bathe himself in water. And he shall be clean. And after that, he may come into the camp, but live outside his tent seven days. And on the seventh day, he shall shave off all his hair from his head his beard and his eyebrows. He shall shave off all his hair, and then he shall wash his clothes and bathe, bathe his body in water, and he shall be clean. And on the eighth day, he shall take two male lambs without blemish, and one ewe lamb, a year old, without blemish, and a grain offering of ten, three tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, and one log of oil. And the priest who cleanses him shall set the man who is to be cleansed, and these things before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall take one of the male lambs and offer it for a guilt offering along with a log of oil and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And he shall kill the lamb in the place where they kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the place of the sanctuary. For the guilt offering like the sin offering belongs to the priest. It is most holy. The priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering, and the priest shall put it on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. Then the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it into the palm of his own left hand, and dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand, and sprinkle some oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. And some of the oil that remains in his hand the priest shall put on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on top of the blood of the guilt offering. And the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed. And the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. The priest shall offer the sin offering to make atonement for him who is to be cleansed from his uncleanness. And afterward, he shall kill the burnt offering. And the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be clean. Now we turn again to the Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Mark in the New Testament. Chapter 1, and we'll read verses 40 to 45. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. 
And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. And people were coming to him from every quarter. <clears throat> this is the word of God. As we have begun working our way through the Gospel of Mark, I've noted several times that Mark's great purpose in writing this account was to show us, by his life and works, who Jesus is. And I've quoted some men who have emphasized the importance of studying the Gospel accounts because of the way in which they make us familiar with Christ as a person. Growing in this kind of personal familiarity with Christ is so very necessary because we need to recognize it is entirely possible for us to have a breadth of theological understanding. It's possible for us to boldly declare that Jesus Christ is the only hope for guilty sinners. And yet all the while to have a shriveled heart and a strangely, sadly distorted view of the heart of who Jesus himself is. The truth is, there is in our fallen human nature, there is a resistance to the true knowledge of Christ. And one of the ways this resistance manifests itself is in a hesitation to come to him. And often that hesitation can arise not so much from problem in our doctrine, but that hesitation can arise from other questions, questions like psychological questions, like, will he really receive me? Can it really be this easy? Just come to Jesus freely and receive. And even in true believers, this hesitation can arise. Maybe after a particularly grievous fall into sin or repeated failure in a certain area, we can subconsciously begin to wonder, will God receive me again? Can it really be that easy? Don't I have to do something to clean myself up first? How do we answer these questions? How do we overcome this hesitation? The answer is that we need to continually confront ourselves with God's revelation of himself in Jesus Christ. We need to study the gospel accounts. We need to see how they place before us again and again the compassionate heart of our Savior. Now, as we have looked at chapter 1, I've said several times that Jesus did not go, go around looking for demons to cast out. He didn't go around looking for sick people to heal. We saw actually very clearly in the previous passage that Christ's great priority in his ministry was not outward healing, but it was on the preaching of the gospel. However, while that is true, we also need to recognize that though Christ had an unswerving commitment to his main purpose of proclaiming the gospel, it is also true that again and again, when people came to Christ with needs, his compassion moved him again and again to address their needs, to receive them, to heal them. In the story that is before us, we see this in a special way, and it's a story that gives us a glimpse once more into the heart of Christ. A glimpse that has implications for far more than Christ's healing ministry. So I want to look at this account with you, highlighting the simple yet profound truth. That in his compassion, Christ is always ready to receive those who come in faith to him for cleansing. In his compassion, Christ is always ready to receive those who come in faith to him for cleansing. And so we'll look at this as it unfolds for us in four scenes. In our first scene, we have a desperate leper's cry for cleansing. A desperate leper's cry for cleansing. Look at verse 40. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Now we know from other accounts that Jesus was in a city at this time. Great crowds were following him when this took place. And so you can picture the scene, can't you? 
Jesus is growing in popularity with the people. People are crowding around him. They're pressing in on him. Everyone's amazed. Who is this man with such authority? And suddenly one day a, a cry rings out over the crowd. I'm clean. I'm clean. The crowd recoils and peels back. Some people in disgust, some people in horror. As a man limps towards Jesus, this man's face is swollen and deformed. His skin is flaky and covered with putrid sores. The awful stench of rotting flesh pours forth from him. This man is a leper. Now, leprosy in the Old Testament does seem to cover a wide range of skin diseases. However, there is evidence that at this time, the disease that we know today as leprosy, often referred to as Hansen's disease, a terrible disease in which the nerves die and appendages can fall off as your body kind of rots away. But that disease was present in Palestine at this time. But whatever the specific nature of this man's disease, we know from Luke 5 that he was a man who was full of leprosy. And therefore, this man would have been disfigured. He would have been ugly. He would have been a, a fearful sight. And we saw in the book of Leviticus that the leper was an outcast in Israel. He was shunned as one who was defiled, one who was contagious, one who was unclean. The law commanded that such a man was to be separated from the community. Everywhere he go, everywhere he went, he had to cry out unclean so that people could know he was coming and get far out of the way. And of course, the worst part for the true Israelite was that he was ceremonially unclean as long as he had the disease, which meant he was separated from the camp of Israel. He was cut off from the temple of God, the worship of God, the people of God. So the social stigma around lepers was immense. They were viewed literally as a man under the curse of God. And so the man in this story was literally an untouchable. He was a hopeless man. There was no known cure to leprosy. So this man was just left alone to his fate to live and die alone as an outcast. In the deepest sense of the word, this man is miserable. And we need to realize under the law, the state of the leper is given as a picture of spiritual death. See, the uncleanness, the ceremonial uncleanness of leprosy pointed to the uncleanness of sin. Just as a leper was driven off and cut off from the people and the worship of God, so the spiritually dead sinner is cut off from fellowship with God and his people. Just as leprosy rots away the, the flesh, so sin rots away the soul. Isaiah actually declared that through our sin, we have all become like one who is unclean. I want you to realize what, a, what an apt illustration of sin that is. So sometimes scripture talks about the sinfulness of sin. Scripture talks about the deceitfulness of sin. In the picture of leprosy, we have a picture, a vivid picture, really, of the defilement and the ugliness of sin. We really cannot begin to fathom the wreckage of what fallen man is. Again, think of who we were made to be. Image bearers of God. We have a dignity. We have a potential. We have a worth that is absolutely incredible. For fellowship with God. For, for reflecting God's very image. But sin comes in and it distorts us. It deforms us. It twists us to something that we were never intended to be. It dishonors and separates us from God so that the sinner is driven away from the presence of God. Sin is a defiling disease that spreads. Sin is a wasting disease that destroys if it's not cured. As we think about that, I want you to realize if leprosy made someone in a desperate state, if it put someone in a desperate state, how much more is our state in sin? There is a far, far deeper disease that mankind has than the disease of leprosy, and that is the disease of sin. And I want to ask the question, have you ever seen and felt how desperate your condition in sin is? Have you ever truly felt that you are unclean in yourself? 
You know, it's so easy, isn't it, to tritely acknowledge the reality of sin, to tritely acknowledge that we're sinners, and yet to have no inward grasp of its horror. God would have us, God would have us look at the picture of this leper, the picture of leprosy, and see in that picture a display of how unclean, miserable, and hopeless we are when we are separated from God and lost in sin. I recognize this world will tell you that such thoughts, saying things like this are bad. This I'm trying to attack your self-esteem. But I want you to realize that for the leper, what we learn from this leper is that it was an honest assessment of the desperate nature of his condition. That was the first step to his cleansing. Because you see, the account doesn't end here with this desperate man. You see, this man had heard about Jesus. He had heard that there was a teacher and a healer with authority, a man with power. In some sense, this man had come to believe that this Jesus was no mere man. We read that he came and he knelt before him. Other accounts and other translations say that he worshipped him. The decree or the degree of understanding that this man had of who Jesus was isn't clear from the text. But what is clear is that he understood that Jesus possessed divine authority. And in some sense, he was worthy of worship. And so he comes, yes, with reverence, but he comes driven by a sense of desperation. This man is my only hope. But again, you can picture the scene, can't you? Here he is. He's been an outcast for who knows how long. And he's limping towards Jesus and the crowd around is staring at him in disgust and horror. And the fears and the doubts begin to well up in him. This man is able to cleanse me. I know he is. But will he? I mean, why, why would one so pure? Why would one so mighty? Why, why would he look at me? I'm twisted. I'm vile. I'm unclean. Maybe I shouldn't have come. There's a glimmer of hope and a glimmer of desperation that drives him on. And so he falls to his knees. And he looks at Christ with pleading eyes and he says, If you will, you can make me clean. He doesn't even dare ask. Just makes a statement of fact. I know you're able. If you will, you can. Well, it's at this point that we see the heart of the Savior. We turn to scene two, where we have a demonstration of Christ's willingness to cleanse. A demonstration of Christ's willingness to cleanse. Jesus looks at this man with all his doubts, all his fears, and still reaching out to him. And we hear the words in verse 41. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. Jesus receives him. This was a man who nobody ever received. This was an outcast. He was unclean. Most people ran away from him. They went in the opposite direction. This man was ugly, defiled, unclean. But Jesus not only receives him, Jesus reaches out his hand and he touches him. This is a man that nobody ever touched. I was reading in a commentary this week of a, a man who is a surgeon, in, a leprosy surgeon in some remote part of India. He spent most of his life trying to help lepers, trying to help find out ways to find cures for the disease. And he wrote that there is one gift above all else that lepers long for, that they value above everything else, and that is the touch of another human being because they feel always like an outcast. They feel so unclean and to touch them is the greatest gift you can give to them. Brothers and sisters, see the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the whole of Christ's ministry, there was never a person, no matter how defiled, no matter how sick, how unclean, how degraded, how sinful, who came in true sincerity and faith, who was turned away. John Calvin writes that while he could have healed the leper by his word alone, Jesus adds the contact of his hand to show his feeling of compassion. Jesus didn't need to touch the man. We learn from the account right after, actually, that Jesus can heal by his word alone. But he touches the man to show his compassion. There's an article by the theologian, the old Princeton theologian, B.B. Warfield from the last century called The Emotional Life of Our Lord. 
He looks at all the emotions of Christ in the Gospels, and he knows that the most common emotion attributed to Christ in the Gospels is compassion. It's not beautiful. Compassion. Jesus looks out at the crowds and he's moved with compassion because they are like sheep without a shepherd. He stands before Jerusalem that has rejected him and he knows knows is going to be destroyed and he wails over it. He sees Mary and Martha grieving over their dead brother and he weeps with them. And he sees an unclean, defiled leper and he reaches out his hand and he touches him. The most beautiful thing about Christ's compassion is that it never terminates on mere feeling. How often with us, isn't it the case, we see something and we're moved with compassion, but either we're unable to do anything about it or we're unwilling to do anything about it. It's not the case with Christ. Christ's compassion compels him to action. The glorious testimony of Scripture is that his compassion has moved him not merely to address the fruit of our problems in misery and disease, but it's moved him to address the root of the problem in sin itself. My friends, the work of redemption, as we talk about the compassion of Christ touching lepers, the work of redemption is the great demonstration of the compassion of Christ for sinners. If it was compassion for Christ to touch a leper, how much more was it the compassion of Christ that moved him to come to earth and take upon himself the likeness of sinful flesh? If you have doubts about Christ's willingness to receive you because of your sin, if you feel that somehow you're unworthy, too unworthy to go to Christ, maybe you feel you've sinned too many times, or you've sinned too grievously, or you feel like you're too trapped in sin to go to Jesus. My friends, look at the birth of Christ. Look at the life of Christ. Look at the work of Christ. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That's why he came, that he might receive the outcasts, that he might display his compassion in healing the sinner. May we learn from this leper to come. This man doubted that Christ was willing to receive him. And yet through his doubt, we have a written record that can confront and destroy the doubts of everyone else who reads it. He came with his fears. He came with his doubts. And he was met not with a Pharisee saying, here's my cure, but pay me first. Do the righteousness first, and then I'll give it to you. No, no, he was met with a heart of mercy. And he found to be true in his experience what we see written over every page of Scripture. Christ is always ready to receive those who come to him in faith. But let us continue. See, the truth is, even Christ's willingness to cleanse would do no good if it wasn't paired with what came next. And so we have in our third scene a display of Christ's power to cleanse. A display of Christ's power to cleanse. Look at verse 42. We read, And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. What a glorious display of power. It was a common opinion among the rabbis at that time that it was as difficult to heal leprosy as it was to raise the dead. And notice that there's no no waiting around. Jesus doesn't give the man a cure and say, Okay, I want you to apply this for the next 30 days, and it should slowly begin to clear up. No, Jesus just reaches out, he touches, he speaks, and the work is done. My friends, there is, there is power in the Savior. He says in the very next section, the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. There is no disease so deep that Christ cannot heal it. There's no bondage so strong that he cannot break it. There's no heart so hard that he cannot soften it. No soul so dead that he cannot revive it. And no sin so vile that he cannot cover it. But again, we ask the question, well, how? I mean, I said earlier that in touching this man, Jesus was actually making himself ceremonially unclean. Now, of course, as God, he could heal a disease if he chose. But how could the perfect, pure Savior defile himself? How could he make himself unclean? 
The answer to that question is found in the prophecy of Isaiah 53. Matthew actually quotes it in close connection with this very event. The prophet declared, he took our illnesses and bore our diseases. You see, Jesus could reach out and touch this man, and yet instead of becoming unclean, he could make this man pure because Jesus himself was going to be the substitute. He, would, he was taking on uncleanness because he was going to bear it to the cross, where he was going to be, as we read in Leviticus 13, we also read in Hebrews 13. Jesus was going to be driven outside the camp, bearing our reproach. He was going to take the shame and rejection of, of sin upon himself. The theological term is imputation. It speaks of a great exchange that took place at the cross. As Christ took on himself the uncleanness of sin. Not just ceremonial uncleanness, but spiritual uncleanness. Though we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, at the cross, Jesus, in a sense, reached out and he touched us. And in a sense, he did become unclean. He became the object of disgrace, of condemnation, of God forsakenness, that he might give to us his perfect righteousness, that he might restore us to a place of honor. And so, my friends, he's able. This account is a very vivid picture that Jesus is not only willing, but he is able to cleanse. And this is the hope for sinners. It's not found in some doctrine alone anyways. Doctrine is important, but it's not found in a doctrine. It's found in Jesus himself, the heart of the Lord Jesus. Again, maybe you're here and you, you, you've listened to this and maybe you, you know that there's a sense of sin within you. And yet maybe you hesitate. You hesitate to go to Jesus. You go back to those questions. Is it really for me? I mean, I believe in the doctrine of election. Is it really for me? Can it really be this simple? Will he really receive me? My friends, learn from this account. That whatever your situation might be, no matter how deep your sin, no matter how hopeless your misery, no matter how filthy and degraded, or no matter how hypocritical you might have been, Jesus stands willing able to cleanse you. Jesus only has one answer for looking, reaching sinners. I will be clean. Again, maybe you're here as a Christian. You've known the touch of Christ's healing hand. You've known it. You've known it in the past. And now you have a desire within you to be holy. You want to please Jesus. Isn't that the greatest burden of the Christian? We want to please our Savior. Out of love, we want to please him. And yet so often we find ourselves even the same sins. We know we should have overcome them by now. And yet we find ourselves falling into them again and again and again. And we would never say it, but sometimes these doubts begin to arise in our hearts. Maybe I have to clean myself up first. Maybe the day will come when I sin, you know, the thousandth time in the same sin that I come to Jesus. And he says, what again? Are you kidding me? Get out of my sight. Go clean yourself up first. And there's this hesitation that arises within our souls. Brothers and sisters, when those doubts, when those fears, if they ever trouble you, arise, catch a fresh glimpse of the heart of Jesus in this passage. If Jesus has compassion for defiled sinners, how much more? For his adopted children. You're not a leper anymore. Even if you sin, you're not a leper. Jesus said, you're already clean. Yes, sure, you need your feet washed sometimes, but you're not a leper. You're his adopted child. This is the heart of Jesus. Every time you go, his arms will be open. So we must learn from this account that Jesus is both willing and he is able to cleanse. He turns away no one who comes to him in faith. Oh, we must go on. We've seen a desperate leper's cry for cleansing. We've seen a demonstration of Christ's willingness. We've seen the display of Christ's power. Finally, in our fourth scene, we see a stern charge to the one cleansed. A stern charge to the one cleansed. 
Look at verse 43 and 44. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. Now it's really interesting. The words that are used in verse 43 are very, very strong. The word translated as sternly charged has overtones of harshness and severity. It could actually be translated rebuked. And the word for sent him away is the same word that's used earlier in this chapter a number of times for the casting out of demons. It's the word that's used actually in, let's see, verse 12, when it says the spirit drove him out into the wilderness. So it's the picture Jesus cast him out. Jesus drove him away with a stern charge. What in the world is going on here? Well, after the account of the cleansing, we are being reminded again that though Christ's compassion moved him to heal, Christ's great focus was not on mere outward healing. We've said this before. It was not mere ceremonial cleansing, but it was on proclaiming the gospel that heals the reality of sin. So Jesus is calling for silence here because he doesn't want the crowds to flock around him as a mere wonder worker. He doesn't want to be hindered from his great task of preaching the gospel of reconciliation. I think the strength of the charge comes because Jesus foresaw the the disobedience of this man. Maybe there was something that he saw in this man that he didn't really grasp who Jesus was. He knew that he was just going to go out and spread the word. And he knew that his ministry of preaching the gospel to sinners was going to be hindered. Now for Jesus is charged. Under the law, cleanse lepers, as we read in Leviticus 14. Lepers were to go to the priests. They were to receive confirmation for their cleansing. And then they were to offer sacrifices so that they could be received back into the covenant community. What I want you to notice is that the job of the priests was not to effect healing. The job of the priests was to confirm that healing had taken place. You could say that their job was that of a health inspector, not of a physician. And so as Christ sends this man to the priest, on the one hand, he is showing his honor for the law, but he also says that it is to be a proof to them. See, in the Old Testament, in the history of the Old Testament, the only instances we have of lepers being cleansed were done by divine power. That is to say, the Old Testament says clearly, only God can cleanse lepers. Jesus sending this man to the priest to be a proof to them, a testimony against their unbelief, to say, look at who I am. And when these priests eventually reject Christ, this will be a testimony against them. But as we think about that, what I want us to focus on is the perspective of these sacrifices from the perspective of the cleansed man. In Leviticus 14, we saw that the sacrifices that were to be offered by the leper were visual pictures in a sense of cleansing, new life, restored union with God and his people. In a sense, they were to be a symbol, a visible declaration. This man has gone from death to life, and therefore he is welcome back into the community of God's presence. But more than that, they were also symbols, not only of his cleansing, but also of his consecration. Think about the the odd ritual where first blood and then oil is... Um, touched on his ear, on his thumb, and then his toe. Basically what it's saying is that what he heard, what he did, where he went, was now under the atoning blood, but also it was anointed. Which means that this man, in all that he was, was now set apart for God, as, as all believers are. You're set apart for God. You are to be consecrated to him. That's what these sacrifices pointed to. As we think about that in In our context, it points us also to the sacrifice of devotion, the sacrifice of worship that we are called to give to God in response to his saving mercy. Romans 12 says, by the mercies of God, or you could say in view of the mercies of God, in view of what God has done by his mercy, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. You see, cleansing must always lead to consecration. It's the necessary response. You could say it's the confirmation that cleansing has truly taken place 
that we willingly give ourselves to Christ. The sad irony in this story, the sad irony with the leper, that he disobeys the voice of Christ. And we don't know if he obeyed the first part of Christ's charge. Maybe he did go and offer the sacrifices, but we know very clearly that he certainly didn't obey the second part of the charge. And I say that it's sad irony because those sacrifices that he was supposed to offer symbolized and represented his consecration to God. And yet by his response, we see that he's not really consecrated to the voice of Jesus. And it hints towards the fact that this man, just like so many others at that time, didn't fully grasp the significance of who Jesus was. He was thrilled by his healing powers, but he hadn't really come to see Jesus as a spiritual king who had brought in the kingdom. He hadn't really grasped that this was a king who was to be obeyed absolutely, whether we understand why or not. So even though he may have gone and offered for his confirmation, his sacrifices, testifying to his ceremonial cleansing, his disobedience to Christ really calls into question whether he had really undergone spiritual cleansing. My friends, it's a warning to us. We can become all excited about the mercy of God in Christ. We can testify to it. We can spread it widely. We can become great evangelists. But at the end of the day, the real confirmation that cleansing in our souls has truly taken place is that we will lay ourselves before the Lord and say, Lord, all my life is now yours. Your word now becomes my rule. I'm laying my body upon the altar as a living sacrifice. There are too many testimonies of people who are zealous evangelists and yet at the end of the day show themselves not to be true because they were hiding sin underneath the surface. The real confirmation of our cleansing is that we give ourselves to the Lord in obedience. So the call of this text is most certainly to come to Jesus. It is to come to Jesus freely, eagerly, quickly. Come now, come just as you are. Expect and trust that you will find him willing and able to cleanse you. But it is also a reminder that when we come to Jesus, Jesus receives us not only as Savior, but also as Lord. And so the questions of the text are before us. Have you really seen and felt how serious your sinful condition is? And if so, have you come, in Christ, come to Christ in true humility and faith for cleansing? And have you experienced his compassion and his power in your soul? And then thirdly, if you have, is your life testifying to a consecrated reality that you have been cleansed and now you are walking in Christ? My friends, I close with this, with this plea. Gaze long. Gaze long at the receptive, compassionate heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the secret to consecration. It's as we see him that we gladly say, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Our proud, rebellious hearts will fight against it. And sometimes we will seek to take our eyes from it, but never forget, brothers and sisters, in his compassion, Christ is always ready to receive those who come in faith to him for cleansing. I said it before, I say it again. Christianity is not a mere mix of doctrines and principles. It is a person. A person of infinite mercy. A person who receives the outcast. Who touches the unclean. And who gives grace to the sinner. Listen to his words. I am willing. Be clean. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for this story, Lord. Even though we're left somewhat in doubt about the state of the leper, Lord, we're not left in doubt about the heart of our Savior. How full of mercy, how full of compassion. Gracious God, we pray, help us to overcome the hesitation in our hearts, the legalism in our hearts. 
Help us to live in the glorious freedom of knowing, knowing the heart of our Savior. Teach us, Lord, and help us to walk in. Father, we pray for those who haven't known this touch. We even think, Lord, of those in churches. There are so many churches in which there are legalistic teachings that bind burdens upon people's back and weigh them down rather than showing them the heart of Christ. Gracious God, we pray for people in such churches and we pray that they would come to know Jesus as he is. And God, we pray, we plead with you that you would keep this church ever from veering to a false legalistic message. Help us, God, help us as believers, help us as a church to major upon the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. We love you. Thank you for your grace. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.